There we are. And radiophobia is, as the video has shown you, is a significant problem. Um, and the effects are well known. We've known about them since even before the disaster, so-called disaster at TMI. After a nuclear accident, you will see the rate of abortion increasing. You will see social stigmatization of anyone that was contaminated at these accidents and branded as untouchables for the rest of their lives. Alcoholism is rife, a mental illness is skyrocketing. And radiophobia is actively being promoted by a large number of so-called environmentalist groups that are trying to promote what they claim at least to be a message of hope in order to spread prosperity around the planet. The problem is, by spreading radiophobia, they have the blood of literally hundreds of thousands of people on their hands. Well, we've come to expect this kind of discourse from our enemies or the anti-nuclear movement or whatever you want to brand them as. But the problem is that as much as the enemy is out there, the enemy is also coming from within. The quote at the very bottom I took this morning from the website of a company actively promoting modern salt reactors and by saying that the conventional fleet is very, very dangerous, the radiation will just cause massive troubles, we need to move away from them to our concept, they do nothing but ensure that radiophobia is alive and well. But we all know that yeah, radiophobia is, is pretty bad, so maybe it's time to, to move on. But well, where on earth do we start? We are stuck in a hamster wheel. Say so if we start to deal with radiophobia, go to the very heart of the problem, deal with people's emotions and preconceptions. The problem is that we've got a regulatory system that's saying that, oh, hold off, in order to build these massive atomic tea kettles, we need to put massive amounts of regulation that no one else has to deal with. But if you, well, tick the boxes and jump through the hoops, you're good to go. Or let's start with the regulations. Let's try to cut back on the enormous amount of red tape that nuclear power have to deal with. Well, then radiophobia will kick in and say, well, hold on, radiation will kill us regardless of its dose. And the problem is that this kind of hamster will become very, very vicious because it then has implications on the amount of nuclear power being built, and it goes on, and on, and on. But let's go back to basics then. Let's go back to the, the standard communication strategy that the nuclear industry has been using for 40 plus years. And we start with the notion that, well, the public, they are merely ignorant and irrational. So in order to deal with this, we'll give them, give them some facts. Tell them the nuclear power truly is the safest, the truly is the cheapest. You know, pick your poison. And once you've done that, people will <laughs> see the light and come to the nuclear place. We've spent many billions over many, many years pursuing this paradigm. But alas, didn't work the first time, didn't work the second time, and it's not going to work the 455th time as we tried. What this has led to, however, is in a complete just evaporation of public support for nuclear power, completely destroyed any kind of public trust there is in, in nuclear power, and have actively made sure that radiophobia remains, remains really alive and well, frankly. We need to accept that as a pro-nuclear community, we were wrong, and we were horrendous. A linear model will never work. It's an engineer's solution to a kind of problem. We can find the problem, we engineer the solution, and you get the outcome. No. Uh, in our research at EP, we have found that it's a bit more complicated than this, and this is about 
2% of the research they've been going through. It is inherently complex. The human mind and the way we deal with the world is inherently complex. So, let's go straight to the cut the chase. Nuclear power has for the past 30 years been linked to climate change as the saving grace. Um, it works well for some people. Some people think that climate change is the number one concern they got. And they will be happy to sacrifice material wealth, foreign holidays, you know it. They'll be happy to do so. However, this is the world use of a very small part of society. It's been calculated by 3% of the population in either the US or the UK believe that climate change is the number one threat, but also that nuclear power poses no or very little threat. That's about 3%. So we've spent a lot of time, a lot of money, chasing people that at the end of the day make up 3%. But there are a great diversity of worldview sites there that we need to reconcile in the way that we approach policymakers or the general public. Some people will be chiefly concerned about the economy, about the jobs market. Others will be very, very concerned about the way we get, well, sorry, where we get our energy from. Do we want Russia or the Middle East to essentially be able to call the shots on our energy policy? No. <laughs> I totally agree with that. Um, but the whole point here is that we all have different worldviews, and depending on your worldview, you will inherently approach the world differently. A one-size-fits-all approach is broken, and we have to move away from it. But the problem is that we are not. We are still sitting, frankly, as passengers in a boat or a car. We see the cliff's edge. We know that another Fukushima-style accident will have to happen. There will always be accidents in any man-made systems. The problem is, in the current master narrative of fear and destruction around nuclear power, another accident will just see the end of the industry. And that is what we are working at, working to change the ATP. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.